Good afternoon and welcome uh, to everybody. We are going <laughs> to have this session. Uh, my name is Ivan Krastev. I'm permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences, which is one of the co-organizers of uh, the festival. And we're going to talk about the 1956 revolution with uh, Istvan Rev. Istvan Rev is a historian, Hungarian historian. He's director of the Open Society Archive and professor in the Central European University in Budapest. He has been teaching in Berkeley and Stanford and other places. And in 2004, he published a book called Retrospective Justice, which I do believe is an interesting book to reread, keeping in mind what has happened uh, in Central and Eastern Europe in the last two or three years. I'm saying this because before giving him the word, I just try in one sentence to frame the <coughs> conversation about the 1956 revolution in the way I see it. In 1978, in a very famous book called Interpreting French Revolution, French historian Francois Fure started with a sentence, the French Revolution is over at last. And he said, I'm saying this because he believes that almost for 200 years, the French politics was a very much a competitive interpretation of the French Revolution. And the identity of the major political actors in France was very much in a reference to the French Revolution. My question to Istvan as the first question is, is the 1956 revolution over in Hungary? To what extent we can understand the current political situation, but also the contemporary history of Hungary in the last years, very much through the prism of 1956? Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this uh, question. And I, I would like to come back to the problems of the, of the French Revolution in the East Central European context later on. But um, to answer your question, most probably as a historical issue, although uh, 56 remains completely open for uh, several different interpretations, um, as a historical issue it is over, but uh, as a, an existential problem, it is still very much alive. Although I was introduced as a historian, um, the revolution in Hungary, I must say, is not a historical issue today. Um, democracy uh, means, besides other things, a basic element of uncertainty, a certain element of uncertainty. Uh, you don't know what will happen exactly in Germany uh, tomorrow, and you don't know what will happen in Vienna or in Austria uh, in 21 days uh, at the elections. You know that there will be elections, but you don't quite know the outcome of the elections. There is an element of, of uncertainty. And this element of uncertainty, in a paradoxical way, plays a very important role in social stability. You know that something will happen, um, and as a result of that, uh, more or less, the uh, expressed will of the electorate will somehow shape the future. In a country where there is no such element of uncertainty, you know for sure, although the Hungarian elections will take place only uh, next year, probably in April, uh, you know for sure what will happen at the elections. You know who will win and more or less you know by what percent and what will happen with the opposition or what will not happen uh, with the opposition. And once more, in a paradoxical way, this lack of uncertainty makes the social situation completely uncertain. So certainty plays a role in uncertainty. If you cannot imagine a foreseeable, formalized, democratic way how to change the government or how to shape the composition of the parliament or how to shape the future, then anything might happen. And you don't know what might happen tomorrow. You know that elections will take place in Germany tomorrow. You know that elections will take place in Austria in 21 days, but you don't know what will happen tomorrow in Hungary. And uh, although we know a lot about revolutions and probably we know too much about revolutions, we know how dangerous revolutions are. We know that the outcome of revolutions are always different uh, from the, uh, 
the wish and the image of the revolution beforehand. We know that uh, revolutions uh, cause real uh, tragedy and suffering, and um, it leads uh, quite often to betrayal. Despite all that knowledge, you cannot say at this moment uh, that the time of revolutions is over in Hungary. And this is why uh, 56 is not just a historical problem, but it's an eminent contemporary existential problem uh, in my country. Uh, let me just, uh, I, I bought you three short, uh, very short videos, and I try to play the first one just to remind you how a revolution look like. Uh, it's not always a festival. No, sorry, this is not the one I wanted to show you. Um, it was the festival. It was the festival, yes, it was the festival. This is not what I wanted to, to show you, but something else, yes, this one. No, uh, something happening here, uh, although I sent the I can't show you what the revolution looks like. Uh, this is the problem with the revolution. You can never show it on time. Fine. So uh, that's fine. No, no, no. I, we can live without that. Uh, so I wanted to, to show you a, a few uh, footage uh, about the horrors of, uh, of uh, 1956. Um, so in that sense, you are right. Uh, 56 is, is not over. However, you should keep in mind that uh, the 1956 revolution uh, lasted only for uh, less than two weeks. And uh, there was no time for it to take place. In a sense, it did not take place. There was a revolution, but it had no time to show itself uh, to the world and to the participants. And this is one of the reasons uh, why it is easy today to read so many things uh, into the, the revolution, uh, to remember it, to commemorate it, to use it it's so, in so many uh, different ways. Listen, this is an interesting story and because the previous session that was here was on 1989. And you remember how much 1989 was praised for being nonviolent, for not having these videos. But one of the paradox of 1989 is that this is a revolution that is not celebrated anywhere. You don't have commemoration of 1989. You don't have commemoration in Hungary of 1989 because in a certain way also you don't have a date what exactly you're going to commemorate. You don't have also commemoration in Poland. You have commemoration of solidarity movement and basically of the strike and so on. I'm asking this because, in my view, you said we cannot exclude the possibility of a revolution in Hungary, but what kind of revolution it could be? If you're going to imagine, I don't believe that this is an easy question, because once upon a time, revolutions used to have ideological name. They could be communist, fascist, liberal. The latest wave of revolution that we saw, particularly, for example, in the Arab world, they have a company names, Facebook, Twitter. So in a certain way, what is a revolution that is possible in the contemporary world? I'm not talking only about Hungary, but in Central and Eastern Europe, because for me the idea that it is an unfinished revolution, and I very much agree with you, is based on the fact that it was so open. These 20 days was so much intensity, but no profile, that everybody can pretend that 1956 was what he wanted to be. It was a leftist revolution, it was an anti-communist revolution, it was a nationalist uprising. So 1956 is great because everybody can claim on it. And how basically these memory wars are going on in Hungary? So uh, let's stop for a minute at uh, 1989. Because uh, 1989 uh, was the, can you hear me well? Or So 1989, as you, no, was the bicentenary of the, of the French Revolution. Um, it was a, a curious coincidence, but I would like to say that the way how the French Revolution was framed at the time of the bicentenary played a certain role in the way how communism fell. 
in East End and Central Europe. Uh, don't forget that the preparations for the celebration of the bicentenary started already several years before. And uh, a lot of very important new studies were published around that time, um, which we can say was a neo Tocquevillian revisionism of the French Revolution, led um, by, uh, by Furet, whom uh, Ivan has referred to at the beginning. And uh, the most important problem around uh, 89 with the French Revolution was the terror. Um, by, uh, by that time, uh, there seemed to be, uh, at least on the surface, a consensus among uh, French uh, historians of the revolution that somehow the seeds of the terror were there already in uh, uh, 1789. That what happened uh, during the time of the terror uh, was in the genetic code of the revolution, that it uh, was not possible to avoid. Uh, Fury uh, went even further, and uh, in a very curious way, uh, he argued that uh, what happened in 1917, and uh, this is the occasion why most probably we have the festival here, the centenary of the Bolshevik Revolution or the Russian revolutions of the two Russian revolutions in 1917. So according to Fure, what happened uh, in 1917 uh, in, in Russia was the uh, obvious natural outcome, continuation of the French Revolution. Uh, somehow, uh, the, the history, the tragic history of the 20th century uh, started with, according to this neo Tocquevillian revisionism, started with the, the French Revolution. There were other French historians uh, who, uh, talking about the counter-revolution in the uh, one day, argued that it was a genocide, uh, it was uh, something that uh, was the prehistory of, uh, of the Nazi genocide. So all the horrors of the 20th century somehow uh, were um, imagined um, by historians uh, in the story of the, of the French Revolution. So according to the French historians, the task around 1989 was how to prevent, uh, from, uh, how to prevent uh, the terror from, from happening. And there was a very close relationship around that time between uh, the French historians of the French Revolution and East and Central European uh, historians, uh, partly working on the French Revolution, uh, partly working for Lech Valenza, trying to uh, get rid of, of, uh, of communism. Um, Bronislav uh, Geremek uh, uh, was very close to the Annals uh, and very close to, uh, to Furet. Uh, Bachko, who wrote a book on Danton, uh, worked in, in Geneva, had very close connections uh, with uh, his uh, colleagues back in, in Poland, which he had to leave back in 1968. Uh, don't forget that, uh, uh, that Wajda made a film um, um, in uh, 1981 about Danton um, and uh, uh, he uh, wanted to, uh, based on the uh, script of a, a Polish uh, playwright and went back uh, and uh, uh, put with him uh, Depardieu who played uh, Danton in the film uh, to see the last days of solidarity uh, in, uh, in Warsaw. So there was a very close connection between people who played a role, intellectual and political role, in the changes around 89 and how the French Revolution was interpreted at, at that moment. And I think that the way how 89 happened, uh, the uh, utmost care how the participants tried to avoid a situation that might lead to terror. Um, in that sense, the French Revolution played a role in how communism collapsed in, 
in East and, uh, and Central Europe. Now, let me go back to, to 56, because Ivan is right, uh, we don't celebrate uh, 89, and we usually do not have particular dates when and how and what to commemorate or how to remember. However, in Hungary, there was a date, and that date is significant. The date was the 16th, uh, 16th of June, 1989, um, the anniversary when the Prime Minister of the 1956 revolution, Imre Nagy, was executed back in uh, 1958, and when, in 89, he was reburied on Hero Square um, in a symbolic way. And uh, it was obvious for the more than 200,000 people who attended this symbolic funeral that it was, not the fun it was not the funeral of simply the martyrs of the revolution, but it's going to be the funeral of the regime. Uh, the regime which had murdered them. And as if it had been a Greek tragedy, uh, Janos Kadar, the first secretary of the Communist Party, who was watching uh, on television the reburial, um, his uh, um, mind was uh, already uh, clouded um, in darkness almost completely. Um, he died uh, six weeks later, at the very moment when, uh, in the chambers of the uh, Supreme Court, uh, Imre Nagy was rehabilitated. Uh, there is a fantastic uh, uh, footage. Uh, you can see the people sitting in the chamber of the Supreme Court, and a small uh, piece of paper is circulating in the benches and what's written on the paper is that Janos Kadar has just died. So uh, that was a symbolic moment that somehow as if 56 uh, had taken uh, the regime into the grave. But what was reenacted um, on Hero Square was not so much the revolution, but the tragedy and the treason that finished the, the revolution, the treason of Janos Kadar and the treason of the regime. It was um, a commemoration of a tragic moment, not an uplifting event of history, not the revolution, but the tragedy of the revolution. And in a sense, if we want to understand the uh, history of the subsequent years in Hungary, um, we have to keep in mind this moment of betrayal and tragedy, the reenactment of this, uh, this moment. Uh, it was not the people who experienced their sovereignty and power and strength toppling the regime, but the people who are standing at the grave. This is how uh, 89 happened in Hungary. Very much, because I want to go uh, uh, to you for your questions, but there is two questions that were important for me and I wanted to ask them. And this is related also how the word the revolution is coming back. Uh, on the 10th anniversary of 1989, the Institute for Human Sciences has a big conference inviting some of the key figures. So Adam Michnik was there, Viktor Orban was there, and Orban was uh, a close friend to some of us. The basic story is he now used the word revolution again. The 2010, as you know, the Fidesz party won two-thirds of the votes in the parliament, and he said the revolution happened at the ballot box. The idea of the revolution is back. By the way, it's back as a radical change. It's back as a positive meaning. And there was a very important speech which Prime Minister Orban gave this July, not two years ago, in which he said the Trump revolution started in Hungary. 
And by the way, this is a very important speech. I'm strongly advising people to read it. It's a well articulated, he knows what he talks about, and he basically said all this kind of a backlash against the liberalism that was very much advertised in 1989, we started here in Hungary. I'm asking this because I'm interested in how the new revolution of 2010 is interpreting 1956, because there is one thing that really makes me very kind of intrigued about the current wave of anti-communism in Hungary. The current regime is very much anti-communist, but what it hates about communism is not the period before 1989, but this is basically what the post-communists did after 1989. Paradoxically, it's very anti-communist, but it's very kind of a friendly to Kader, and very kind of unfriendly to the basically post-communists in a broader sense that have been governing the country after 1989. So I'm very much interested in your reading of this, if you're going to agree that this is a real phenomenon which I'm observing. Um, I think that uh, to understand the official interpretation um, today of uh, 56, <clears throat> we have to go back to the official interpretation of 56 after the defeat of the revolution. What happened? Uh, from 1957, uh, officially in, in Hungary. And what happened was, as uh, you might know, or some of you might know, that the revolution was turned into a counter-revolution. That was the uh, official label um, the, uh, the regime used when talking about 1956, that it was the second edition of the White Terror, uh, following uh, 1919, uh, the short-lived uh, first Hungarian Soviet Republic, uh, that uh, according to the communist, 56 wanted to restore the pre-Second World War semi-feudalist uh, autocratic Horthy regime, um, that uh, it wanted to get rid of nationalization, uh, it wanted to uh, bring back the landlords, the aristocrats, uh, the, even the Arrow Cross from 1944. That was the official interpretation uh, of the regime. Now, today, the official interpretation is that 56 was a revolution, but uh, the content of the revolution, according to the official historiography today, was almost the same than how uh, the communist regime uh, understood the counter-revolution. According to uh, the Orban regime, 56 wanted to restore uh, the uh, pre-Second World War uh, regime. It wanted to restore the continuity of Hungarian history, that communism was just a, a break, an unnatural event uh, in the uh, uh, Hungarian history. and. Uh, this is what the preamble of the uh, new Hungarian constitution says, according to which uh, Hungary lost its sovereignty um, in March 1944 when the Germans invaded Hungary. And that sovereignty was restored only with the first post-communist democratic elections. So what happened in between, uh, between the spring of 1944 including the deportation of over 500,000 Jews and, and the Roma, uh, including the uh, uh, forcing the uh, Hungarian uh, Germans uh, to leave, uh, the Slovak-Hungarian uh, population exchange, the collectivization, the gulag in Hungary, all these things had nothing to do with genuine Hungarian history. It was something forced on us, first by the Germans, and then by the Soviets, we had nothing to do with this. And so what is happening today is an artificial um, operation to try to restore the continuity of genuine uh, national history. However, uh, this is not a very simple operation. What the government tries to do is to airbrush from the history of the revolution all the reform communists. Last year, uh, on the 60th anniversary of the revolution, the name of Imre Nagy 
was not mentioned at all. Uh, none of the reform communists uh, around him, uh, those people who were uh, hanged uh, by Kadar in uh, 1958, uh, those who were mentioned were uh, these young boys uh, in the streets uh, in 1956 who threw Molotov cocktails on the Soviet tanks, who shot uh, uh, at the tanks as if it had been nothing but uh, a real carnival of the uh, young Hungarians defending uh, the uh, national uh, sovereignty of the country against the Soviets as if it had been nothing else but a national revolution against the uh, foreign invaders. Now, it is dangerous uh, for a regime that uh, considers itself the regime of law and order uh, to commemorate the young revolutionaries uh, in the streets and there is a certain uneasiness in that. So the emphasis both on historical continuity, the restoration of the uh, pre-Second World War regime, and the revolution of the streets against the uh, foreign colonizers and invaders. This is how uh, the regime today uh, tries to commemorate and remember the revolution. I'm just going to open uh, uh, for discussions. Just for those who are not following Hungarian history, I put it several figures in order to basically get the scale. As a result of the revolution of 1956, 200,000 people has left Hungary, basically run away. 22,000 were persecuted. 13,000 people were interned domestically and more than 300 sentenced to death. So from this point of view, I do believe it's quite important because we are really talking on the scale of the events that is not, to be honest, uh, if you compare with 1981 in Poland, you're going to see that, of course, you don't have this level of mass mobilization where in Poland, basically, you have almost 10 million people being the members of the Solidarity in 1980, but, of course, the tragic dimension in Hungary uh, overshadows things that we have seen in Poland in 1980 or even Hun uh, Czechoslovakia in 1968. So from this point of view, it's not by accident that 1956 is at the center of what we're talking about. But now it's, uh, uh, and it's not only questions. I know that here in the room, there are many people that have been researching this period, who, who know the period. Uh, it will be very much interesting to have a real discussions, but please. Can I add, can I add something? Um, to this figure of 200,000 uh, who left uh, uh, after the defeat of the, of the revolution. Um, today, the Hungarian government, when the government is reminded to the fact that after 56, the West, the world was so welcoming and accepted uh, the uh, Hungarian refugees, unlike Hungary today, um, which does not let um, a single um, refugee enter the country unless uh, he or she is a persecuted Christian priest. Uh, so the government says, um, um, in the face of such uh, uh, criticism, that that was a completely different situation. Uh, first, uh, those Hungarians were um, overwhelmingly Christians. Um, their culture was not different uh, from the culture of the of the host country. Um, uh, they were uh, politically persecuted. The situation was completely different. Now, we have been doing a research at the moment in Budapest about th uh, the close to 70,000 Hungarian refugees who ended up in the US. And what we found was that, first of all, 95% when they were questioned about the motives why they had left the country, um, they answered knowing that th this was not the right answer, 95% of them answered that they left because of, not because of political reasons, but because of other reasons. 
we know from the archive of the International Rescue Committee, which uh, had its headquarters in Vienna at that time, and Vienna played a very, very important role in helping the Hungarian refugees. So we know from that archive that the Rescue Committee had to follow uh, the fate of uh, tens of thousands of Hungarians until the end of the 1960s, to a large extent because there were so many problems with them. It was so difficult for them to get integrated into the American society. A very large number of them ended up in prison. Uh, we know a famous story um, about uh, father and son uh, who became uh, very important uh, drug dealers in in Miami. We also know that around uh, Camp Kilmer, uh, which was the arrival point of all the Hungarian refugees in the US, uh, the police uh, um, had to be strengthened uh, in the coming years uh, as a result of those uh, common crimes that uh, uh, my uh, uh, countrymen committed uh, there after they uh, they arrived uh, there. So, what I would like to say, the situation um, it was completely different than what uh, the government uh, today uh, tries to, to paint. In the past four years, close to 600,000 Hungarians left the country. 600,000. Uh, mostly educated young people. So when you ask the question, what is the reason why there is no real political opposition in Hungary, this is part of the, the answer. All those people who would be uh, in uh, oppositional organizations are not there anymore. And not only not there anymore, they can't even vote. Because unlike ethnic Hungarians in Transylvania or Slovakia or in the Ukraine uh, who got back their Hungarian citizenship even without paying taxes in Hungary and with that the right to vote, they can vote by mail. Hungarians living in Western Europe cannot vote by mail. They have to go to the Hungarian embassy to vote. So imagine someone um, in uh, in uh, northern Canada uh, who has to travel to, uh, to Ottawa uh, to vote or somebody from Edinburgh to go to London uh, just in order to cast his or her, her vote. So that a majority of that 600,000 people cannot take part at the elections next April. Thank you very much. As I said, we are going, uh, just before coming, it's only two very short sentences. One is, you should be really talented in 1950s in Miami to make career in drugs with all the Cubans being there. So this uh, yes, says, yes. yeah, okay, it was before. Uh, but secondly, I do believe 1956 is also quite interesting from the propaganda point of view because this is also the story of the Western betrayal of Hungary. Yes. So please, <laughs> Eva. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, first of all, a, a very quick remark uh, to your first sentences, Ivan, where you said that the French Revolution is finally over. Uh, the French, yeah, the, the French have made a very wonderful paradoxical invention, and that is called la tradition révolutionnaire. And that is still very much alive today. And when they go marching on the Place de la République, on the Esplanade de Saint-Valide, it's la tradition révolutionnaire life. But I wanted to ask something uh, to Professor Rave. Uh, I was very interested in what you said about that whole propaganda of the counter-revolution and the whole issue of continuity. And uh, I remember I was with Chancellor Wronicki, it must have been 1987 or so, in a bilateral meeting with then Prime Minister Gross Caroli, Gross Caroli. And in the course of that conversation, he said something which I found at that time extraordinary and which I've never forgotten. He said, you will have to prepare yourself for great changes because the centrifugal forces have become so strong, we cannot hold the system together anymore. 
And uh, that was the first uh, sort of inclination that we then had about the things that were brewing and, 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 and were coming up. And from the perspective of Vienna, we always had the feeling that under the cover of the Communist Party in Hungary, more than in any other of the Eastern European countries, sort of the, the continuity of old political traditions was still alive between the farmers and the old aristocracy and the socialists and so on. There was the whole the, the mantle of communism, but underneath, uh, that was still there. And I wonder whether you see that as a historian uh, also. Thank you. That, that's an interesting question. And it is partly true and partly not true. And I think that there was a real break uh, with 1956. As Ivan has mentioned, 56 um, was considered in part as the final proof of the intentions of the West. That despite uh, the liberation rhetoric and the liberation ideology of the Truman and Eisenhower regimes, the West would never come and help us. Until 56, there was the hope that that was just a transitory period. And then the Americans will come and uh, the situation will change. Until 56, a former aristocrat who became a taxi driver was still uh, uh, greeted as Herr Graf. Um, after 56, he became a taxi driver. Um, people understood that communism was there to stay, and Yalta had to be taken seriously. On the other hand, you are right, because um, there was no opportunity for us to talk about our past. Uh, there was no opportunity after the Second World War to talk about the what happened before the Horthy regime. There was no opportunity to talk about uh, wh what happened during the Second World War. We did not have a story of the Second World War. We were unable to talk about the Second World War. The communist uh, came up with the story that Hungary was a fascist country and uh, uh, was Hitler's last ally, which is true. At the same time, the communists claimed that although Hungary was and still is to a large extent a fascist country, uh, we somehow uh, became uh, the uh, victors of the Second World War because we ended up on the side of the Soviet Union. So retrospectively, um, we became part of the anti-fascist coalition. Although Hungary was defeated, we were the winners. But, but this story did not make sense. So we could not talk about the Second World War. We could not talk about uh, the way how the communists took over. Everything was under the surface. Everything was uh, in darkness. Families talked about certain things at home, but there was no space for publicly discussing all these issues. And because of the um, impossibility of reflecting on what happened, uh, thinking about that, somehow things remained there frozen. And, uh, and then uh, from that frozen state, somehow the country woke up in 89, uh, not knowing uh, who we are, uh, who, uh, were waking up um, at that moment. Uh, we did not know much about ourselves. Um, we did not have the stories, uh, what to tell to each other. People thought in 89 that we had a story of 56. It turned out that we did not have a story of the revolution, for example. Thank you very much. There is a question there. Yeah. Can I? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your interesting conference. Uh, I would like to ask a question because I like to go back always to the roots, uh, which is not in the main focus of uh, the uh, discussion of today. But I would like to know how do you see 
uh, the events um, in 1918, 1919, when Bela Kuhn introduced uh, the communism, uh, following uh, Lenin's uh, example or trying to follow uh, Lenin's example. They had established a red uh, direct uh, phone line and uh, Bela Kuhn was was due to do what Lenin wanted and uh, to start the so-called world revolution. I mean, it was certainly not a revolution. How do you see it? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, um, uh, first of all, um, we should not forget that uh, in 1919, we are after the cataclysm of the First World War. Um, the First World War, which, uh, which was a uh, world historical event that somehow did not make sense. The contemporaries were unable to explain to themselves what happened. The last British soldier who died in the course of the First World War on Armistice Day, uh, 11th of November 1918, uh, was buried 400 yards from the first British soldier in, in Normandy. Uh, so a whole generation died and nobody could m make sense of, of that. Um, it was the, the moment uh, in that cataclysm of utopias and uh, obviously uh, the uh, Bolshevik revolution which to a certain extent as we know it was a coup against uh, the outcome of the February revolution um, played a very important role in utopias in uh, in Europe in general, especially in, in East and, and uh, Central Europe. Uh, how we uh, remember today of 1919 is through the prism of uh, how it was remembered during the uh, time of the Horthy regime, during the interwar years, that it was a red terror, uh, that it was uh, a, a horrible farce, uh, it had nothing to do with uh, with our history, and even uh, the uh, so-called bourgeois revolution uh, in the uh, late fall of 1918, when Count Karoly uh, came to power and the and Hungary became an independent country and uh, and uh, uh, not anymore part of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy is considered to be by the present government as a treason because the, the bourgeois regime, according to the present interpretation, paved the way for the Red Terror, um, uh, which was a, a, a horrible un-Hungarian element uh, in the history of the region. We have nothing to do with it. This is what uh, children learn at school about that, which means that they don't learn anything because we have nothing to do with it. It is not part of the history, history curriculum of schools. There was a, yeah. um, yes, Joel Stoltz, as a journalist for Le Monde, I covered very much Hungary in the uh, past years. Um, and I have I want to, according to what uh, Ivan Ovotny said about the, the French uh, uh, tradition revolutionnaire, I, I want to say something about the impact at that time uh, of the uh, rebellion or revolution um, in Hungary on the communist uh, party and the communist opinion in France, which was very strong. And then I have a question to both of you. Uh, about the impact in the Eastern Bloc um, for the uh, further generations. But let's speak about France. Um, at that time, the Communist Party in France was very, very strong. My father, for instance, was a member of the party uh, following his involvement uh, in, the, uh, in the fight against Nazism during the war. So they uh, had a lot of communists had, of course, be very grateful uh, after Khrushchev uh, denounced the crimes of Stalin and they identified very much with this kind of critic. When it happened that the uh, Hungarian Revolution was crushed, it was uh, many people, like my father, was, were completely in disarray. They protested, they discussed very much inside their uh, politi in the, inside the political organization because for them 
uh, Ibn Enoj was not uh, a fascist or reactionary man, it was a real communist, it was a, a good man and he, it was important to, to support him. So it, this was one of the reasons he was expelled um, later by the Communist Party. And uh, I think uh, that uh, it, it didn't come to uh, a lot of uh, expulsions of, uh, of an open rebellion, to an open rebellion inside the party, but it was the first time um, that the people uh, started to adapt. And then, of course, you had Czechoslovakia. And, and, this, and here I come to the question. Uh, there are many people who think that the generation uh, who was, for instance, with Gorbachev, um, uh, let's say, for instance, his uh, uh, speaker, uh, um, Andrei Grachev, was in Budapest as a young diplomat, not so well, of course, with probably the higher uh, instances of the party, of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union at that time. But he came in contact with, of course, with the Hungarian society. Other people went to Czechoslovakia, other, others to, to Poland. And uh, uh, there is a theory that this played a role um, because, of course, the, the people who wanted to, to change something inside the communist system had seen that it can be very dangerous, you can be crushed. So the question was how to do, what are the alternatives? Poland was this self-limited revolution um, and, uh, and then uh, the Soviet Union, it was the decision of Gorbachev to change things from the top. What, how, what do you think? Did, did it play a role, um, the revolution, the Hungarian revolution, in this evolution of the, inside the communist movements in other Eastern countries? Uh, thank you. You are right. Um, the defeat of the, and the fate of the 56th revolution had uh, tragic consequences uh, for the uh, communist parties and in general on the left um, in the Western world, especially in France and also um, probably even more dramatically in Britain um, at the time. And a lot of people um, decided to leave the Communist Party, unlike François Furet, who remained member of the Communist Party, by the way, until the end of the 1950s. And, uh, um, this uh, led uh, to writing his book, The End of um, the, uh, the history, of, history of an Illusion, to try to make sense of uh, his decision to remain member of the, of the Communist Party even after the defeat of the, of the revolution. I don't think that 56, in this sense, played any role in the developments in the Soviet Union. Let me mention an, another fact that Andropov, um, who um, became Secretary General uh, before Gorbachev and who for a very long time uh, was the head of the KGB, was the, the Soviet ambassador in Budapest during the time of the revolution. Um, and uh, if 56 played a role in the development uh, of the Soviet Union, pr most probably it was the opposite um, impact that uh, the Soviet leadership understood that the uh, situation could become very dangerous and they should not let the satellite, satellite countries uh, to undermine the stability of the party and the regime. From Bulgarian perspective, and I'm not a historian, but there are two things. 1956, in fact, consolidated Yalta. And if you're reading the American foreign policy documents, you're going to see that between 1948 and 1956, we have one understanding of the Cold War, and this was very much about the transitional nature of the communist regimes. And after 1956, you have the, the idea that basically we're talking about recognized spheres of influence. What delegitimized the communist regimes was 1968. It was Prague, it was not Budapest. 
And it was Prague for many reasons. Also, I do believe because it was kind of the last story uh, uh, of the idea that communism can be reformed from within and so on and so on. What I find interesting in the legacy of 1956 in the Hungarian type of a context now are two things. One is communism now is very much associated with internationalism in general. So basically being anti-communist means that you should not buy any type of a cosmopolitan view of the world. Be it liberal, be it... So in a certain way, everything which is not based on the nation and ethnicity cannot be the nation. And from this point of view, basically, this very strong anti-internationalism can be used against different enemies. And secondly, nevertheless, that you have a very strong Christian discourse in the current identity of the government, Christianity was nationalized. This is not Christianity, which is universal religion, which is very much headed by the Pope. This is Christianity, which is we, Hungarian Christians. And I find this very interesting because at least for me, and this is going to be my last question to, uh, to Istvan before finishing, I do believe we see a strange paradox. Globalization make people know each other much more, we're connected much more, we travel much more, but the paradoxical result of it was a major crisis of any universalist views and religions. It's not only political ideology. Look, both Hungarians and the Poles are among the most Catholic nations in Europe if you go on the opinion polls. When it comes to the migration crisis, the view of the Pope on migration simply doesn't matter. It was not even seriously discussed. I'm not saying is it good or bad, who is right or wrong, but from this point of view, there is no any type of authority beyond the nation state. It's not simply Brussels. It's not simply Merkel. This is the problem that all authority is national. And I do believe, paradoxically, uh, the internationalist nature of the communist movement was used very much to justify it, this very strong anti-internationalism. I don't know to what extent you're going to agree with something like this. Uh, I, uh, I agree with this, uh, with this last remark, but let me um, disagree with one of your uh, remarks. Hungary is one of the least religious countries in Europe. Um, according to op opinion polls, only 17% of the population considers itself religious, despite the fact that officially 76 or 77% of the population is officially uh, Catholic. Um, you have what they call belonging without believing. Uh, there was this pure research. <laughs> um, yes. Um, now, I, I think that what we, are, what we are witnessing in Hungary today is, is something very strange. Uh, according to the uh, official leaders of the Hungarian Catholic Church, Hungary is becoming less and less part of the universal church. The Hungarian Catholic Church is becoming a national church. One of the bishops uh, referring to the Pope said that the Pope does not know what he says, um, which is a strange uh, interpretation of the infallibility uh, dogma um, of the church. Um, uh, the Hungarian government uh, uh, criticized the Pope that the Pope washes the, uh, the feet of migrants but does not stand up for persecuted Christians in the Middle East. <coughs> the Hungarian government has just appointed a state secretary um, in charge of uh, defending the faith, as if we lived in the Middle Ages. Um, uh, Hungary is building a, a Catholic school in, uh, in Iraq uh, at the moment. Uh, Hungary uh, granted uh, Hungarian citizenship to uh, two Syrian um, Catholic uh, priests um, this week. Um, so, uh, Hungary is uh, um, not part anymore of the, of the universal church. We should, we, should, we should basically, I remember there was a historian who was telling me a story about 19th century Hungarian peasant 
who went to Budapest at the end of the century, he went into a bookshop and he asked for the globe of Hungary. So I do believe it's not a Hungarian trend only. I can see a lot of Bulgarians going to the bookstores and asking for the globe of Bulgaria. <laughs> But probably this is going to be one of the unintended consequences of globalization. Allow me to thank very much Istvan Rev for this talk. And just to tell you, he's, going, he's now writing a book on the history of the fake news. And knowing him... It's history of making facts. Okay, history of making facts. And the good news is that on October 4, in the Institute for Human Sciences, he is going to give a talk to us about on something that he's working on it, so feel invited. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.